Hey, everybody. I hope that you tuned in and you're having a great day. Today, we are here for Game Beyond the Game. We have a special. Um, this is Talk That Talk. At first, it was a 21-day transition, and now it has turned out to be something much more. So I'm really excited. Right now, what we're going to focus on is this three-part series that we have, speaking about mental illness, mental health, uh, depression, and suicide. Not suicide ideation, but suicide. So um, right now, I am joined by two amazing guests, Eric Hipple and Eric Kramer. They are both are incredible individuals. I don't want to go too far in their bio because they'll be able to share their story today, but today you have a spe you have a treat. We're going to be sharing our story about our identification of depression and also suicide and mental illness and health. So uh, before we jump right into it, I just want to ask you guys um, a couple of questions about mental health and about mental illness and uh, when it become present in your life. And so we can spend about two minutes or three minutes on that and we'll go into uh, giving our bio. So um, I guess I can start with you, um, Hippo. When, 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 when were you, first and foremost, what does mental health mean to you and mental illness? Well, I, I guarantee the definition I have of it today is completely different than the definition that I had when I was growing up because there really wasn't any definition. You know, nobody just, nobody looked at these certain things and said, oh, by the way, you might be, you know, this might be affecting you or you're feeling this way because of a thing and, and there's a reason to it, right? And so, you know, I can take mine all the way back to when I was growing up as, as a kid, you know, I'd have, you know, these sometimes really overwhelming thoughts, you know, when I was growing up as a youngster in bed, you know, and these nightmares and, and things about death and stuff I would have, but, you know, I was a pretty sensitive kid, you know, and so as a late developer, and that means that, um, you know, I wasn't like the star of uh, anyone's show. <laughs> you know, I was, I was just kind of happy to be, um, but I cared a lot for people. And so I would say that going back and looking at some of those, those students I had back then, you know, led me to think that, you know, there's a, today I would say, yeah, then I would know that there's things to look for. But then uh, really from a standpoint of view of actually really identifying with it, not, not until, uh, probably in college was, was really dominant because I missed a large chunk of my, uh, my junior uh, semester, uh, chunk of quarter, a quarter uh, when I was a junior in school, mm -hmm. um, just couldn't get out of bed. But that was, you know, that was really, really prominent. But still didn't ever talk about it, still didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. That's where it really became something. Nice, nice, nice. Kramer, what about yourself, man? What does um, mental health mean to you, mental illness? Well, I would say, you know, it's, um, I think anything that's, that takes you away from either the here and now or positively thinking about the future or in some way getting hung up on the past where it then overwhelms your future or your present. So I think um, this isn't a question I've ever really spent much time thinking about, mm -hmm. and I'm, but I'm glad you asked it. Because I think the mental health part is uh, living your life in a way that you're fully engrossed in what you're doing today, or you're planning something with a certain expectation about tomorrow or sometime in the future, or you put something on your calendar in, up in the distance in the future that you can look forward to, like a vacation or a trip or, or some sort of big event that's upcoming. So... I think it's what turned for me into an obsession about the tragic events that all seem to compile at one time in my life. I'm not sure I could have done anything about that because that was completely out of my control. Um, so I, I think I just at some point became, became overwhelmed by events mm -hmm. that led to thoughts that and emotions that I, I quite honestly didn't know how to deal with. Wow, wow, that's beautiful, man. Same here. Um, you know, mental depression. I mean, mental health and mental illness to me 
mental health, I piggyback off of what you said, Kramer. It's just about, you know, being in a good space, learning how to be more of who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, like if we can use the analogy when we're talking about being healthy in your body, we do all the necessary things to keep it strong and to build those muscles. And so when it comes to um, the mind, uh, it's, it's giving it, it's feeding it the right proper and the right nutrients so we can grow it. And a lot of times um, we don't get that. We don't get that due to maybe the level of education that our parents had. And so they, they bestow upon us some of their, their, their habits that they, that they have that never really helped them exercise mental, um, mental health. You know, and so mental illness is like the opposite where you are thinking about uh, being destructive and, and uh, harming yourself uh, because of this, this conflict, this internal conflict with you know, you're, you're good and you're bad or you're up and you're down or, or I, didn't, I didn't fulfill my expectations. And so when those two things clash and, oh, I'm sorry, when you mix your emotions in there, and those two things, and, you know, those all of those things clash. Um, it's like a whirlwind, and, and that's where mental illness, you know, uh, that's what it means to me. Um, so I want to ask you guys about uh, depression. Why is depression not spoken about openly? And also, what's the taboo behind it? Well, uh, uh, um, I'm guessing I'm going first here. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, well, I think one of the reasons why is is because it's complicated. It's not an easy thing. It's not like oh, here's a here's a uh, an owie, uh, put a bandaid on it, or let's see the doctor for this. It is more complex. We can get there in so many different ways. The symptoms are complex. Um, even though there's a common thread of symptoms, these they are numerous different types of symptoms that can be there as well. Um, and it's it's not just one spot in the brain that's affected. It's it's your whole being. Is, is affected so because of this complex nature you can't like just put well this is it right here and so it's really it to identify and it can be brought on by stresses you know that you know, push on uh, our genetic makeup you know maybe our environment you know where we come up from maybe how we are the adaptability we have for handling stress um it can be situational it can be um you know there's season affective disorders so there's there's type of things by the environment that we're around can affect us and how we feel and stuff and so so it's complex and the thing that makes it really stigmatized is the name okay depression it's down it's dirty it's ugly it's like you know something's wrong with you you're not able to perform you're not able to be up you know and and anytime you come into that it's it's it has a sense of a weakness and people don't like to talk about a weakness and so i think that's why the stigma you know, mm. Mm, that's a great perspective. What about yourself, Kramer? That's interesting. You know, um, back when I, I played with the Lions, I was there for four years. And uh, I began working with a psychologist back there just on life. And it turns out he, he was actually had a background in sports psychology. So uh, I guess over the time, over some time, over the years, he got to know a little bit about me and my growing up and um, I was married at the time and had uh, just going through some of life's ups and downs. And then he did a great job, I think, of helping me um, get into, a, uh, I guess, a mental state of being every day, whether it was practice or game, didn't matter. And that way I could, in terms of like, Eric would understand when you want the game and practice for that matter can happen at a quick pace and you go in with maybe you watch a bunch of film or you've worked out running or weightlifting or stretching or whatever but to put all that together it, you almost have to slow your brain down a little bit and and otherwise there's no way you're gonna you're gonna execute all the little things you want to execute and this particular psychologist did a great job with me and eventually, um, I went on to play and have a career that I never could have dreamed about. 
And eventually this person I was working with, um, and it was back in Detroit. So even after I left Detroit, I still worked with him. And at one point he approached me about, this is after I was done playing, about potentially writing a book and how my experience with working with him and how that might translate to other people. And I was, I backed away from doing it um, because of, I guess I was afraid of people looking at me in a way that um, wasn't just a guy, an athlete, quarterback, whatever, uh, like doing what everyone else was doing. Right. And, and it was an it was an area that I really wanted to explore in order for other people to learn more about me. It was very, it was a very, it almost felt like I was going to be putting myself in a box. Mm. And that felt uncomfortable to me. Right. Interestingly, now I've approached him. This is now after all a bunch of life's other issues getting in, you know, coming into play. But uh about, you know, and I don't know, maybe I'm at this point, maybe it's too far gone, but I, I now have a different perspective in that this would be a great thing to do. Mm. Um, so I think that what you brought up about the stigma of um, mental illness or depression, I think carries that because I would have had to tell that story mm. even back then. Right. And, and um, uh, that, that was just something back then I was uncomfortable doing. I wish I wouldn't have been, because I wish now looking back, I wish I would have done that with him. And um, I don't know, I just, I, I think part of it is I felt I, I succumbed to what I projected other people might think about me in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. When in fact, I'm guessing in 99 or 100% of everybody would have looked at it completely different. Than what, than what I thought it would have been. Right. No, you're so correct. And, you know, there's a statistic that says 46.6 million people in America have some type of mental illness. And one of the things that you mentioned, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that you, you, you're mentioning like vulnerability, being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, like as athletes, as a professional athlete, we're taught to be gladiators, you know, we are right. be strong, be this, be that. And the minute you feel depressed, it's like, <laughs> like, 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 like Hipple said, I'm not, I'm not gonna expose myself, you know, like I'm, I'm supposed to be down, you know, depressed. The word depresses me down, mm -hmm. you know, you're down and depressed. And so it's hard to put yourself in a vulnerable um, space and then share your most vulnerable moments with people when you really don't even know much about yourself. Mm. And so it's, it's like a, a, like our society doesn't perpetuate, Hey, it's okay to be de depressed. It's always like, no, stay positive, stay uplifted. Let, let's not talk about these things. Oh no, no, let's, let's just, let's just sweep that underneath the rug. Um, it's okay. You, you'll get over it. You know, but um, I, I think one of the big, biggest reasons is just because of, being vulnerable. And we know a lot about ourselves from a scientific standpoint, mm -hmm. but I don't think we spend enough time with ourselves from an internal standpoint to understand like, wow, we are, I'm, I'm more than just, you know, this great arm that I have. I'm more than these great legs or, or how many abs or sit-ups uh, or push-ups I can do. I'm more than that. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, it becomes a very difficult time for us to be able to express ourselves about depression. So, yeah, go ahead, Eric. As I say, you know, I, I also think there's a, a there's a, a piece to that which is um, not wanting to disappoint. Um, I know I was driven by, you know, by don't don't be disappointing. You know, don't be disappointing. You know, so that, that drives some of our motivation to be, you know, to excel. Like I don't. And whether, whether, you know, how that's coming to us, whether it's from the parent or it's from the society or it's from your friends or whatever it might be that drives that, you start rising to the top of your deal. And as you become a leader, then, then you automatically don't mean to, but you automatically assume some of this um, responsibility that you feel 
you know, over other people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's silly, but you do, right? And so, because people start looking up to you and, and they see the image, they don't see you. But as that image grows and you start putting yourself in that image, then that means that if I now all of a sudden came forward and said, you know, I ain't doing too you know, then I'm disappointing them. And so I don't want to disappoint. And so I keep driving forward and forward. And, and so that's the stigma in itself. You know, we, I, I think what you said, that projection, you know, Eric, you said, uh, projection onto somebody else, your own thoughts. I think we do that. We're projecting that disappointment. I don't want them to see me be that person. And so it helps, it hurts the, no, it, yeah, goes along with the stigma. Yeah. yeah, no, you're so true. You're so true. One of my one of my good friends, Cordera Howard, um, he said something to me that really changed my mood. It made me feel really good. And he told me, uh, he said, P, you don't have no reason to hold your head down. He said, because someone is always looking up to you. He said, man, you did all the things that everyone wished that they would have done. Uh, he said, you did it at a young age. He said, so never put your head down, man. He said, because somebody's always looking up to you. And man, that 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 made my day. And not and from making my day, it made my week. And from making my week, it made the month better. And I thought that was a great saying. So if, if, if you know anyone that is down and feeling depressed, like that's the best comment to ever give to them. Like keep your head up because I, we are looking up at you. So no matter if you're down or you're up, we are always going to look at you and see you as our leader. So that, that was very powerful. So thank you for sharing that as well, Hippo. All right, all right guys. So we're going to go ahead and go into our storytelling and get this out the way. So uh, I am going to stop you at a highlight. If you get too high and you climax, I'm going to make sure I stop you right before you climax so we can finish our story for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> you know, all kinds of interpretation, but anyway, hey. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll briefly introduce myself. Um, so my name is Prince Daniels Jr., um, former athlete. I grew up and I was born in Houston, Texas. My father is a is an let's say immigrant uh, from Ghana, Africa, and my mother um, is a American citizen. So they met um, sometime in 1980, I believe, and I was born in 1982. Um, shortly after they got a divorce, and around this time, I think we were, we were living in Mississippi, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And so um, from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, you know, I grew up not really knowing too much um, of my, well, I knew my dad when I saw him, but I didn't spend as much time with him when I was younger. Um, my mom and my dad, they got a divorce at, a, at, a, at an early age. And then after that, um, it was just a household of myself, my mother, my sister, and my brother. And so um, we grew up in uh, Mississippi. And then around the age of 12 and 13, uh, we moved to Houston, Texas. Moved to Houston, Texas, and I started growing up. Started becoming a young man, and but I started hanging out with my friends that were, uh, that were not doing some of the, the, the best things in the world. <laughs> so I started participating in that and um, lucky because I was a, I was, seemed like I always had a lot of luck on my side because whenever someone would get in trouble or whenever the whole group would get in trouble, I'll be the only one that would be able to get away. And I'll say to myself, I'm never gonna do this again. <laughs> and the next weekend I'm doing it again. <laughs> So um, from there, I really had a, a great childhood, grew up, um, studies was always the biggest thing in our house, you know, make sure that you read. We used to read to my mother um, and until she falls asleep. And then once she falls asleep, we'll sneak out the house and, and go and play. <laughs> so that was really awesome. Um, from there, around the age of 12, 13, uh, one of my uncles said that it was time for me to go and stay with my mother. And, I mean, I'm sorry, with my father. And so um, my my father convinced my mother to allow me to stay with him. He said, um, in order for my son to be a man, he has to see one. And so it would be the best thing that you could ever do is allow for my son to come stay with me. So my mother had a conversation with one of my uncles out of four, one out of four, and he said to her, you know, who you think loves uh, PJ more than I do? 
And so um, after some talks, she reluctantly allowed me to <laughs> go and stay with my father. And it was like a, a 360, or no, it was a 180. It was a, it was a 180. <laughs> Man, the, I mean, from the very first day I got in the car, my dad was just like, you will eat, you will sleep, you will do your studies, and you will come back home, and you will do it again. <laughs> and, <laughs> and i never forget, I looked out the window and I just started crying. Like, <laughs> so um, from there, I really excelled in school and um, sports. Um, ended up uh, being a walk-on at Georgia Tech. I didn't do well on the a ACT, SAT, but I was a, a high school standout. Um, and from there, Georgia Tech, they came rec and recruited at my high school for the first year. And I still didn't have a scholarship. My head coach had spoke to the recruiter coach and told him, hey, we got a diamond in the rough. Just check him out. He checked me out, gave me his card. I went to Georgia Tech. I spoke to the coaches, um, George O'Leary and uh, Bill O'Brien, the head coach for the Houston Texans. You know, <laughs> And, and um, uh, it was it was – it was really interesting. You know, George O'Leary, I actually had a chance to see him not too long ago. And he was just like, hey, I remember you. He's like, you was that walk-on kid from Texas. You know, you did it. You had a great career. Um, and that has been 13, 14 years ago. And when he said that, I was like, he remembers me. <laughs> so it made me feel really well. Um, got to Georgia Tech, earned a scholarship my first year. And then shortly after that, um, no, after my second year, then shortly after that, um, I started playing, broke NCAA records, all um, all ACC, all academic, and then I get drafted to the to the Baltimore Ravens. Um, I played with the Ravens for three years, and this is the, really the first time where I, I realized that I didn't have a hold on my emotions. Uh, and the reason why is because man, no one really prepared me for the business side of the NFL. No one prepared me for the business side of things. My dad taught me how to be a man, but did not teach me about, you know, the business side. And that's uh, nothing against my dad, but he didn't know as well. So I'm entering into uncharted territory. And um, it's, it's almost like it's a, it's a dog, eat dog, um, dog eat dog world. And so you have to you know, prepare yourself for whatever's whatever's going to happen. You're going to have some encounters with with some of your teammates, some 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 people that you do not like, uh, you don't get along with. Sometimes you gotta go to work and you you try to make a, a truce with um, some of your the other teammates and say, hey, don't hit me today, man. All right, don't hit me. I, it, it'll be okay. And you know, the someone on defense uh, ended up hitting you, and it's just like, ah, oh, let's go. So. You, you you know, you try to get past that process and um, had a really great career. Uh, well, great experience in Baltimore. Didn't really play as much because I kept getting injuries. My, my rookie year, um, my rookie year, they didn't think I was ready to play. So they sit me on, set me on the sideline. Then I improved, my game improved. The next year I get injured right before the season starts. Then the next year, same thing, get injured right before the season starts. So I felt that I could not contribute to the team, and I was getting heckled by some of my teammates. And I, by that time, I started started becoming more of a um, – uh, uh, angry at myself for not being able to produce and, and you know, and, and, and show my talents. And um, – Around this time, I started threatening my teammates. Uh, it went from, you know, trying to maintain composure to like, all right, so, uh, you know, if you touch me, if you do anything to me, I'm going to come back up here and, you know, like murder everyone. Um, I didn't want nobody to do anything, say anything to me because at this moment in time, I started when I was the when I was talking to myself, uh, it was it was more so about negative thoughts. So um, from there, I started going to a little depressional phase, and then I had a talk with Matt Stover, who was a kicker, a longtime kicker, and he told me to start thinking about my post career. 
And I was like, my post career? What do you mean? I, I'm just getting, I'm just beginning my career. How are you gonna tell me to start thinking about that? Like that doesn't make any sense. And so, um, um, from there, I started realizing like, wow, I'm about to be exited out of this game, and my mind could not really wrap around that concept. So, um, I get sent home, and or get released from the team. Well, actually, I get I get hurt my last year. I, I tear my labor in my shoulder. I go and do rehab in Atlanta, Georgia. I come back to the Ravens. They said they're going to go in a different direction. They let me go. They didn't tenure me my next year. So I just kind of, that's when I hit my first wall of depression, or my second wall of depression. And then um, I went and trained for one whole year, and no one called me back. And then we go into a deeper level of depression. And then shortly after that, um, no one called. And I started saying to myself, wow, like, Am I a failure? Matter of fact, I am a failure. What did I do wrong? How did I lose my first job? What, what, is it me? How, I know it was me, but what did I do wrong? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Is there something else that I could have done? I'm asking myself all these questions. And then from there, um, went to depression. Um, I, I started identifying myself with depression. Like, um, like um, man, this is not good. And then it led to me having suicidal thoughts. Just saying to myself, like, I know that if I just end my life, this all of this will go away, and I'll be much better. Um, and um, I saw so I put a three-day plan together of my demise, of how I was going to do it the first day. Um, I used to tell myself, like, it's time to kill yourself. Let's go. Like, let's go. Let's go. I started rallying and prepping myself, you know, to, to commit this act. And, um, you know, day one, day two, I was getting ready to do it on day three. Uh, my bullets were scattered on the ground. My gun was right there. I just loaded it. And I was going to make my last few phone calls. And um, uh, right before I went to my closet and put my gun underneath my neck, you know, I was, I'm going to stop right there. And I'll just save a little bit more for tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, um, yes, that's who I am. That's me. That was my 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 experience with suicide and, and, and depression um, and mental illness. So um, I think I know our audience would love to hear more about it. So Hippo, please take it away. And um, then Kramer, finish it off. Well, you know, the, uh, as I said, not being able to identify exactly what, what those emotions are and those feelings are and where they come from. You know, like I said, I was kind of like the, the late developer or something. I, I never felt like I fit in as a, as a kid. I was kind of like the tag along. And, um, and certainly with my brother's friends, I was a tag along and maybe that's why I felt like that all, with everything I did. But the um, um, but then, you know, football came around and, and I played in, in the Pop Warner Football Leagues, you know, the Little League football. And uh, we had a really good team. We won the Southern California Championship, you know, for our area, winning playoff stuff. And, and, and through that, I learned, you know, Hitting. I learned it's fun to be part of something, but more than anything, I had some really good leadership from another father that was there. My father, who's always been really supportive, but he was also the type that would, you know, he would let you know his disappointment as well. And and I think you know that that kind of drives you, you know, because you don't want to do that. Um, but it's from some of these other coaches, and, and and they were always like adults, not not so much my peers around me that I kind of gravitated towards. I felt safe around them, you know, and I always felt kind of not safe around other kids uh, because I didn't quite, I always felt they were more advanced than I was. So anyway, then in high school, as I started to excel and caught up to my body more or less, I became the quarter, quarterback my starting year, uh, my junior year, went to the playoffs, and all of a sudden I'm in this whole other seat where now people are looking up to me and can't do no wrong. Teachers are, you know, really, you know, patting you on the back and, you know, <laughs> everything else, you're getting all these, you know, wow, this is kind of a weird space to be in. But um, I never belonged to one click, you know, as um, I kind of belonged to different cliques, you know, and that meant I didn't belong to any, um, but I participated in a, in a bunch, right? So um, even though I might have been seen as a jock, you know, I, that's not how I felt anyway, because I never felt like 100%. Uh, long story short is, you know, when you have these ups and downs, and I had, had them in, uh, in high school too, I started drinking a little bit, you know, in high school to get through some of the, those anxiousness parts. But um, but in the back of my mind, there's always this little ongoing thing like, 
Um, I think at the time, Elton John's uh, song, um, I think I'm going to kill myself, I'm a little suicide, but, but you know, it's, uh, that was always running the back of my head, you know, and I, I, it always, it always taunted me, you know, like when things get difficult, hey, there's an option. So it's like a coping mechanism. You could always do that. You know what I mean? So you just played with it. You know, it wasn't serious, but you played with it. Going into my, uh, I got a scholarship, one scholarship to Utah State. Going just before the, uh, I reported to camp um, school, I was involved in a car accident. We, a friend of mine and I myself were out in the desert dune bugging and, um, and then we flipped the, flipped the car, uh, Kern River out in uh, Southern California area. Uh, and the car flipped, fractured my skull, um, hurt my shoulder, bounced head, had fluid and blood coming out of my ear. And I was out, woke up in the hospital and um, neurologist says, you'll never play football again. Mm. My father, of course, was, this is the biggest, oh, oh, no. <laughs> and um, he went and got another neurologist that, that, that passed me, said, no, no. So, okay. So I went on, didn't tell anybody, went up to school, started football, um, really felt, they dropped you off and I felt that, again, that wanting or that kind of like homesickness, you know, um, where do I fit into this mess? And, but again, I became a starter and um, started taking off and, and that all was good stuff, right? I mean, all that great feedback and everything else, it made school easier because, you know, small school star, you know, that uh, you got a little more, <laughs> you know, leeway to your work and stuff that you're doing and then people are accepting you and everything else. And, but um, injury and things like that, but I still don't know if you depression. And the one that I had, the major one was my junior year and I just couldn't get out of bed. Didn't want to get out of bed. I just want to sleep. sleep. Um, I brought a dog home. <laughs> so anyway, it was a stray dog, basically. And I brought it home and let it live with me. And, we, and I lived in the dorm. You know, mine was on the bottom level with the window, so I just let it run and out, run and out. But I'd still get up and say hi to my, you know, teammates when they came back, so they wouldn't know anything was going on. Say hi, and they'd go, then go back in. Um, and uh, my grades bottomed from that. In fact, uh, I really I wasn't eligible to follow to play the following year. And listen, I got my grades back up. So the coaches and everybody else got me into summer school, got some, you know, grades back up, got my deals so I was eligible again, but we never really discussed what was going on, you know, or why, why, why couldn't you get out of bed? What was happening? So the, uh, so that took off. And then, you know, uh, after that graduation, I am getting married. I still think today, sometimes I got married because I was depressed, you know, and I wanted to belong to something and I wanted somebody, I wanted to be safe. You know, um, and uh, there was a local girl that had her family was right there in town and everything else. And so I think I gravitated, gravitated towards that. Uh, so anyway, um, got drafted by the Detroit Lions, got to Detroit, um, had a huge breakout year, my second year in the league, and became the starter. Now, this is a time that was kind of, you know, there was a couple strikes that were going on. We had, I went through two different strikes, but there was a lot of turmoil going on because the guy that I replaced was liked by the coach. General manager liked me. When I replaced him, he, he broke his hand, and I went in as a 13 quarterback, I became a starter. So going into the next year, there was a lot of confusion on who's going to be the starter, right? The GM and those, they wanted me. I actually earned the position, but the, hey, you can't get lose your job because you're injured. So they kept trying to – but the coach would never make a stand and say, you're the starter or you're the starter. Well, you guys just figure it out, which is asinine and stupid because you, how, do you, how do you gain respect from the team when you're supposed to, and I'm trying to be respectful, and it's just a just complete crap show. And, um, and I was in the middle of it, right? I still got, when I got a chance to start, started to do really well. Anyway, long story short, they got rid of him finally. I became a starter. I had, a, um, you know, 82, 83, 84, 85. Um, and then, uh, and then going into 86, then I got, um, hurt in 87, broke my hand, broke my ankle in 88, and then, um, came back from that and only played, uh, half a season in 89. Uh, we had drafted Barry Sanders, had a new offense going in and I just couldn't, I, I really couldn't run that offense. You know, I wasn't mobile anymore. And so I got released midway through, uh, midway through the, the my 10th season. And I remember, you know, they called me in and said, hey, uh, well, 
I knew I was going to, I, I had a really bad game. So I went on my day off because I knew they were going to want to talk to me. And they did. They called me up in the office and they, uh, they said, you can call a press conference if you want. Uh, but if you don't say you're retiring, we're just going to cut you. <laughs> so I said, well, <laughs> so you let me go out with dignity, but that means also no other team out there is going to say, oh, he's available. So, but I took that option. You know, I was tired, 10 years, that's getting up. You know. So I took that option. And like Eric says, I, I wish there were certain things that he didn't do, you know, he would have done differently, like his book. <laughs> I wish I wouldn't have said I retired because I think I could have played this more. <laughs> anyway, but I did. So, okay, well, this is it. And I left the game in a way that um, I didn't really feel good about. I was glad they let me have that, um, but I had not a clue what to do. And um, I went through divorce, um, got remarried, which is the best thing in, in the world in, in my life. Uh, still married to her today and great support, love and everything else. And, you know, kind of like a soulmate, funny conflict and, and that part of it. But I had some great kids, um, you know, from my first marriage and, and uh, we started family. So everything seemed like really great. And then it was like about five or six years later that it really hit me, you know, had a, started a, uh, a business, was doing well, um, thriving, had people working for me, but I didn't feel complete. And that's when it started. That, that depression thing set in again, not understanding what it was, but just started retracting, tired, you know, things seemed to be overwhelming really easy. I just didn't feel like doing it and started to distract myself and also started self-medicating along that way as well. So I started drinking more and everything went along with it. And uh, at some point in time, it was uh, driving down the road, not doing well. And then we're gonna start right there. <laughs> <laughs> Driving down the road and not doing well. I'm looking forward to that tomorrow. I need to make sure I write that. It's funny, down. It's funny when we cut that part off, like you cut that part off for yourself, you cut that part off for me. We kind of laugh, right? Right. But those are really serious moments in your life when that's happening. And um, and yet we deflect a little bit by kind of going, okay, because we're doing well now. Right. There, man, it was, well, we're going to sleep till tomorrow. No, you're so correct. You're so correct. And I, I, I think that's that defense mechanism of like, feeling uncomfortable to talk about it, but also feeling comfortable to talk about it because we're in a better space, you know? So, but man, that was beautiful. I'm looking for, I'm, I'm writing that down, you know, driving down the road. And so, yeah. for tomorrow. <laughs> All right, Mr. Kramer, go ahead and give us your story. All right, well, uh, I guess, to, okay, so to go back as a kid, um, like Eric, I grew up in Southern California, a little bit north of where Eric did. And um, so uh, never had experienced anything with um, uh, any mental illness or suicidal thoughts or nothing like that. Um, uh, it w and, you know, I played youth football too. Um, happened to be on a team that uh, was put together uh, with some kids that were incredible athletes. I mean, incredible. And we ended up, I think we went, I don't know, two or three years without losing a game. Now, some of these guys ended up either playing in college or professional football. Some of them died. Some of them went to jail. Um, that's just, I guess, part of life sometimes. But I, I've stayed in contact with a few of them, even a couple ones that went to jail. And, um, you know, this life takes its own turn sometimes in, in our lives. But, um, you know, after that, when I went to high school, I never started at quarterback. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I, I, I actually did as a sophomore. Um, high schools back then started in 10th grade. And so the school I went to, I started on JV and in the third game of the season separated my shoulder or broke my collarbone or something. So that season was over. Came back the next year was a backup on varsity. Came back the next year and switched schools. So the school I went to, they had a good football team. And I got beat out by the guy that was, he didn't start the year before, but he beat me out. So, and then the next year I set out, I went to junior college, but I went part-time 
And then the next year I was a backup. It wasn't until actually my third year out of high school, which was technically my second year of junior college, that I even got to play. And from there, um, we had a, an unbelievable season. And I ended up getting a scholarship to North Carolina State and had a good, successful couple years there, but didn't get drafted. And then I, my first team, I, I was an undrafted free agent with the New Orleans Saints and then got cut and was back in school, going to finish up my degree and probably get into coaching. And then, as Eric knows, in 1980, this is 1987, strike happens a couple games into the season in the NFL, and I get called by a couple teams, and one of them is the Falcons. So I end up going down there and play for what I think is going to – I don't know how – no one knew how long the strike was going to last. So it ends up that we played in um, – three games, and at the end of that, um, the Falcons ended up keeping me. So I was the only guy they kept off that team. And now it was a little bit of icy return, because when the regulars came back, they also, their left tackle was a guy named Mike Ken, who was the president, the player rep, president of the player reps for the NFLPA. So I was no one's favorite player within that locker room. And um, came back. I stayed on that year. Went to – I didn't dress for a game, but traveled with team and so forth. And then next year came back and had a pretty good training camp, I thought. But then on the last day, I got cut and ended up sticking around. No one called, you know, thinking maybe there would be someone, a team or two. Nope. Ended up going to play in Canada. Played in their last six games. And then um, came back the following year. This has been 1989. And before we ever played a game, we had an inner squad scrimmage in which I blew out my posterior cruciate ligament. So that year was over. So then it was 19, getting ready for the 1990. And I was living in a triplex over in, in uh, what was it, uh, West Covina. No, somewhere over there on the west side. Um, and uh, I'm calling around to every NFL team. And at that time, there was, I think, 30 teams. So Carolina and Jacksonville were not yet in the league. So one team called me back, and that was the Lions. So I flew out there for a workout, and I sat in uh, – they brought me back. I didn't know who the coaches were, nothing. So I go sit in the offensive coordinator's office, and he's not even in there. So he comes in, and it's Mouse Davis. And he looks at me like, who are you? <laughs> he had no idea I was coming, no idea once I was there who I was. And we end up, the, the Silver Dome, the turf was rolled up. And this was in the middle of, I think, February. So there were no players in town. And we got in Mouse's car, and the receiver coach was June Jones. So we drive down to the University of Michigan, and we're in their indoor facility, and, and Mouse is having me drop back and throwing to June who's just standing at little stationary targets around the field. And I, I remember this because Alan Trammell, the shortstop for the Tigers, was hitting that batting cage in one of the end zones. So he's hitting in there and had my little workout, sent me home. And eventually I get signed there later. And um, that was the year they drafted Andre Ware. So I'm thinking – Andre gets drafted in the first round somewhere. I'm thinking I'm my next. My, I'm going to be the next phone call they make to tell me, hey, thanks for coming out for this mini camp, but I think we're good for quarterbacks. Well, didn't happen that way, and ended up having a few years to play there. So, and then eventually I went on to Chicago, and I think, um, you know, I, I had really only experienced depression one time as um, as a player that I remember. Um, and that was when I went to Chicago, brought in, like I said, I, a long time went by with no, I think when I went to NC State, they brought in two other junior college quarterbacks. When I, you know, uh, I was an undrafted free agent, got cut, and, you know, my experience in the NFL after that was calling around all these teams and finally landing in, in Detroit. But Chicago came and got me as a free agent 
that was the first time anyone ever said, hey, we want you to be the guy. Well, turns out that a few games into that season, I separated my shoulder there, and the guy that had replaced me, Steve Walsh, we were winning, might have been winning ugly, but we were winning. And I think we ended up going to the playoffs that year. And so that, that coming in every day, and this was the first time not only – the team, the head coach and all the organizations said, hey, we want you to be our starter. They paid me like one, and yet I wasn't playing. So that was that was my first bout of ever think this thing, depression creeping into my life. Um, showing up to, to the facility every day and not really being a part of anything was, was strange. Um, but then years went by and I started getting bouts of depression more centered around, I guess, my, my marriage more than anything. And, um, and over those years, Eric and I connected a bit and um, not knowing really much of Eric's background, I knew he had, he had had depression in his life as well. And that's how we connected. And, and then it was, um, you know, my, my career ended. I had some injuries at the end and had a neck injury my last year. That was uh, 1999. And um, it was shortly after that I got into, uh, uh, was running some quarterback camps, actually, and then got a phone call from a guy that said, hey, do you want to come down and audition for something on Fox Sports? And I'm like, okay. So I went down there, and that taught me that I don't care what you think you know about football speaking about it is a whole different matter in the way that they would like to hear about it. So, um, uh, but I learned it over time. And at that, at that time, this is like the early 2000s, um, Fox had taken over um, NFL Europe as far as broadcasting. Goes. And they'd gotten, of course, in, in their foot in the door with the NFL. So I learned a little bit by going over to NFL Europe broadcasting, you know, a couple weeks at a time here and there. And Broadcast a few NFL games as well, and um, this took place over probably oh five or six years, and was on a few NFL uh, Fox Sports Net shows, like a fantasy football show, and it was I was having a good time doing that, coaching my kids in youth football, and then um, in 2011, um, my oldest son um, Griffin died unexpectedly and uh, uh, those are tough times and um, uh, so as I look back on it I can't reproduce that that emotion that of hearing about that um, but uh, you know that, that just brought on some difficult times and then not long after that um, my mother who had been battling cancer for a little while uh, about eight months after Griffin passed away she passed away and then um, I my dad um, <clears throat> uh, even though he had been some to me anyway he had been something of a tough uh, person for me to figure out a little bit in life he kind of lived through me in a way that made me uncomfortable even early on and um, but uh, around that time my mom passed away, my dad uh, had gotten um, cancer. And so it, his was more of a long, drawn-out battle. And um, so watching him go through that, again, given everything else that had happened too, sent me into a bit of a, eventually, a big downward spiral. Along the time, along the way, or at that time, I called Eric, and he had, um, not knowing this, he had put together this program in back in Michigan, and so he said, "Hey, get on a plane, get back here, and you know, uh, this program will look after you." Well, I went back there, and it was a, a depression center, uh, Dutton. 
near, 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 but not on the University of Michigan campus, probably maybe what, 15, 20 minutes away drive wise. And it was this farm house. And um, from the moment I got there, I thought, this is not the place for me. When in fact, it was exactly the place for me. And um, uh, it, it is just, you know, I, s some of the things that that took place there, like I, apparently I, I took part in, a, in some study I don't remember being a part of. Um, and um, when I got home, I don't remember how, how I got home. And I don't remember who picked me up at the airport. Now I do. But um, so I don't know how long after I got back, um, uh, but it couldn't have been that long. Um, I, I pretty much began this thing that I was going to make an exit. Uh, wow. Get out of here. Wow, wow, wow. Oof. <laughs> All right. We're going to stop it right there, man, because we got to. I, I would free. like for you to go deeper into your story tomorrow. Um, so we have a couple of minutes and we're going to wrap it up. Um, um, but man, these are some powerful stories. These are some very powerful stories. Um, and it also allows me to get a chance to know uh, um, Eric Hippo, Eric Kramer as well. Um, um, I remember reaching out to Eric Hippel and well, actually I reached out to the NFL PA and I just was like, I need some help. If you guys don't help me right now, then this is probably be your last time talking to me. So, I mean, within 24 hours, they was just like, hey, uh, they called me back and they put me on the plane to go and meet up with Hippel. And, uh, you know, first thing I was saying to myself, like, hmm, how can Hippel help me? And he showed me his video. <laughs> he showed me his video where he got mutilated and and crushed, you know, like a, he ran out of bounds and somebody smacked him. And I was just like, that guy can help me. I need to, I need to, you know, I, <laughs> he can help me. So um, um, ever since then, I, you know, I was always thankful for Hippo, Hippo to come to my aid when I needed it the most, man. So um, I think this is wonderful. I think we're going to just stop right here and and look forward to tomorrow because we have some inter interesting um, things to say for tomorrow. Tomorrow, our our flow will be we finish our story and then after, after we finish our story then we're going to go into um, um, solutions solutions on how you know we we overcame how other people can overcome um, that are viewing this and and some of the things that you know we look to 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 do and improve in our life so um, tomorrow will be part two where we will be discussing you know the peaks of our mental uh, health crisis and our journeys um, to recover. So my tools and solutions. So look forward to tomorrow. Fellas, thank you so much for your time and your energy. Uh, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. You know, I feel like I feel like I need to put my hand in the middle of y'all. <laughs> they, you know, Great. we're out. But uh, any, any final words real quick, guys? Or just looking forward to tomorrow? I, I was going to say uh, really quick. Uh, it's incredible to me the resilience the foundation that that you guys have, right? I mean, how 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 Eric got into the NFL, how you got into the NFL, how I got into the NFL. You know, it, it was just, but they're different stories, and ha had to overcome you know things that itself, and uh, and then the commonality of all getting back together again. But anyway, uh, it's just uh, yeah, cool stories, man. Really cool. Yeah, no, really, very cool, very powerful stories um, that needs to be shared with everybody in the world so um for our audience look forward to tomorrow tune in uh 2 p.m pacific standard time 5 p.m eastern standard time um as i close this out just want to tell you if you know of any other athletes that will want to tell this story be a part of game beyond the game please follow us subscribe like us at our youtube page or um, facebook live um other than that I look to see you guys tomorrow and Game Beyond the Game presents Talk That Talk. Peace, fellas. All right.